There are way too many DeFi hacks these days where regular investors like you and I get hurt. In February, Bitcoin hit a trillion dollar market value for the first time, but it was also a record breaking year for crypto thefts. Over $600 million in crypto. $1.2 billion. $3.2 billion worth of crypto was stolen. In fact, it's estimated that over $10 billion was lost in 2021 due to these hacks and exploits. So I dove into five recent hacks and came away with 10 lessons learned that you gotta know. If you watch this whole video and you don't learn something useful, then let me know and I'll personally apologize. All right, lesson one is that these hacks vary a lot in nature. Let's take a look at three examples to see what I mean. First is the Ronin hack. This is the bridge that Axie Infinity uses. So the funds in their bridge was controlled by a multi-sig, short for multi-signature. So you need multiple signers to approve a transaction. They only had nine validators and it took five of them to approve transactions. The parent company of Axie Infinity owned four of those validators and they were hacked. So the hacker only needed one more key to compromise the system. They got that extra key from Axie DAO, which was granted special privileges from a deal with the team. But those privileges were not revoked properly, so the hackers got that fifth signature and was able to withdraw millions worth of users' funds. If you think about it, the system worked as designed. It wasn't a smart contract hack, it was more of a social engineering type of hack where the people holding the admin keys got compromised. You could argue that the system was poorly designed though because you only needed five validators to drain all the funds and four were held by a single entity. Like, what the heck? Now the second case to take a look at is the Beanstalk exploit. This was actually a governance attack made possible by flash loans. So the attacker used these flash loans to buy a ton of Beanstalk tokens. They were able to gain a super majority of the voting shares and they made a proposal to give themselves all the money in the pool. So this was quite different in nature from the Ronin attack, but it also could have been prevented by a different design. Like if there was a lockup period between voting and execution, then this could have been stopped. The third case to consider is the wormhole attack. This is the famous bridge that connects Solana to other blockchains. So the attacker was able to trick the Solana side of the bridge to think that they deposited a lot of ether on the Ethereum side of the bridge. So they got a lot of wrapped ETH on the Solana side without depositing real ETH on the Ethereum side. They were able to do this because of an unpatched Rust smart contract on the Solana side. Fortunately, Jump Crypto, one of Wormhole's largest backers, was willing to step in and make them whole by depositing 120,000 ETH to make things balanced. The conclusion here is that all these attacks were so different in nature. Some attacked the people holding the admin key, others attacked the governance process, and then others attacked the smart contracts themselves. Also, it doesn't matter what type of DeFi project it is. It could be a lending protocol or a bridge or a DEX. All are vulnerable to attack. So point is, you can't let your guard down for anything. Moving on, lesson two is that you got to manage your risk properly because DeFi projects vary in risk. If it's an unproven, riskier project, then put less of your money in it. If it's a long track record or it's a simpler protocol, then maybe you can put some more in. So you gotta gauge risk properly and scale your capital accordingly. I saw some people on Twitter talk about losing six plus figures on Beanstalk or Iron Finance. And I'm just like, why? Those were objectively risky, like they had anonymous teams or they had no big backers. They were kind of just doing DeFi in a fly-by-night manner. So if you went all in on them, then you were gambling in my eyes. For something like those, I wouldn't recommend putting more than a small percentage of your portfolio in them. Now as for lesson three, it's that we can't always rely on bailouts when a DeFi project gets hacked. Like when it happened to Beanstalk, the team came out and said that they didn't raise money from VCs. So unfortunately, no bailouts were coming. Of course, it's better to have big backers in case they do decide to bail out the project, but even that's not guaranteed. Remember how the Terra team was looking to raise money to bail out UST? Well, talks broke down when the system collapsed faster than expected and holders were left screwed. So just because big funds back a protocol does not mean you are safe. This isn't like the US government deeming that banks are too big to fail. Nothing is too big to fail in the crypto world. Moving on, lesson four is that 
we should spread our risk by diversifying what we use. Like if you're trying to earn yield on your coins, you can spread them across a handful of different protocols, perhaps even on different blockchains too. You can even use some centralized yield products, so you are truly spreading your risk far and wide. You could also apply this principle to stable coins that you hold. Like some people held all of their funds in UST to get that juicy 20% anchor yield, but that turned out to be a huge miscalculation. So if you want to hold some riskier stable coins, that's fine, but maybe also hold some safer ones like USDT, DAI, or USDC. So if something happens to one of those, you won't lose all your money. Even if you diversify though, you gotta keep in mind lesson five, which is that some things are better slash safer than others at the end of the day. For example, wrapped assets are never as good as the real thing. They are only as secure as the bridge or contract holding it. It's supposed to be one to one on both sides, but as we saw when Luna was crashing, bonded ETH on the Luna side was struggling to maintain its peg with regular ETH. Also, multi-sig bridges are riskier, whereas secure relayers like Layer Zero may be better. In terms of stable coins, USDC is the safest. It has real collateral backing it, huge institutions involved, and it's kind of centralized too, so they could potentially freeze funds if a hacker steals a lot of USDC. DAI is relatively safe too. There's still some risk there, but they held their peg beautifully through the brutal 2018 bear market when its underlying collateral dropped like 90 plus percent. So point is, yes, we should diversify, but not everything is created equally. So some things are safer than others. Now the next lesson has to do with something super unique called DeFi insurance. But before you go out there, a quick shout out to our video sponsors, Deso. They're trying to solve the huge problems plaguing social media these days, but they're doing it in a way that doesn't require a billionaire to buy the platform and make changes. Instead, they built a custom layer one blockchain that scales as more people join the network. There's no gas fees, and it's the fastest syncing blockchain out there. Anyone can write their own decentralized social media app on Deso. It's completely open source and all content is stored on chain. This means that you own your own data and social graph, so you don't have to be worried about getting deplatformed. For creators, we get to monetize their content upfront and fund our next big idea by launching a DAO or NFT in just a few clicks. Deso already has a bunch of working apps that you should try out, like they have Web3 versions of Twitter, LinkedIn, plus tools to launch your own DAO. So go check them out using my links below. All right, lesson six is that we can buy something called DeFi insurance to protect ourselves. Yep, I bet you didn't know that this existed. It's very similar to regular insurance where you pay a premium that varies depending on several different factors. These are specialized policies that could cover DeFi protocol hacks, stablecoin crashes, or even exchange hacks. Some examples include Insurace, Nexus Mutual, or you can Google yourself to find the other options. One important thing to note is that you gotta read the fine print to see what they've successfully paid out before and what they haven't. Some things are not covered that you would expect to be covered, like maybe there's an edge case or some specific requirements are not met. Also, this has to make economical sense too. Like if you're paying so much for the policy that is more than what you're trying to cover, then you might as well just not use it. But besides what we can do as users and investors, Lesson seven is that DeFi projects also have to take security much more seriously. They honestly should put a massive investment into their security practices from day one. Like they should be getting a ton of audits of their code and use building blocks for their code that are more battle tested. They shouldn't be reinventing every piece of their system from scratch. Also, they should have a lot of employee OPSEC as well. Maybe as much as huge companies do, even though they're a small startup. Projects also need better monitoring systems in place. Like, did you know that that Ronin hack happened days before it was noticed. The faster you notice and attack, the better up your chances at minimizing the damage. Perhaps they could even introduce delays on execution. So something like the Beanstalk governance attack cannot happen. Point is, there's a lot of actions that DeFi projects can take to reduce the chances of a successful attack. Speaking of audits, lesson eight is that these are not everything and they definitely aren't foolproof either. After all, an auditor needs to review every tiny part of a code base to look for each possible attack vector, whereas attackers only need to find one angle to successfully penetrate a system. So even if a project is audited, it doesn't mean your money is safe. Furthermore, audits aren't created equally either. People on crypto Twitter have been calling out Certic audits as being the worst in the industry, whereas teams like Trail of Bits are known to be much safer. So just keep that in mind when you see a project boasting about a recent audit. You should be asking, by which auditing firm? 
But besides audits, another thing teams have to do is lesson nine. They gotta have a generous white hat incentive program. White hat hackers are your benevolent and legit hackers. They hack projects legally and with the intention of helping the team fix their vulnerabilities. Oftentimes teams give these hackers hundreds of thousands, if not millions in prize money if they let a team know about a potential hack vector before it gets exploited. That's actually a win-win situation because the protocol survives, but also the hackers can get clean funds that they can use in the real world. If they decide to steal the funds instead, they have to worry about getting chased across the world and getting all their funds frozen. After all, chain analysis tools are getting super powerful these days, and there's not a lot of fiat off-ramps that don't have KYC AML processes. This means that hackers cannot get their dirty funds out of the system anymore. They'll get traced across the blockchain even if you use mixers, and eventually they'll get frozen by some centralized entity, like those Bitfinex hackers' funds. Those two New York kids got caught after trying to use their dirty Bitcoin for years. They had to get like small Walmart gift cards because they definitely could not send all that money to Coinbase and try to withdraw it. So what does all this mean for the future of DeFi? Well, that's my lesson 10. The future of DeFi is regulated whether or not we like it. Andre Cronier, one of DeFi's biggest rock stars, wrote about this in a recent blog post. He mentioned that DeFi builders may have to adhere to government standards in the future, but that that could potentially lead to safer protocols, instead of right now where it's like the wild west, launch whatever you want type of environment. Regulated DeFi may more resemble the traditional finance space, which I don't like, but that is maybe what institutions are waiting for before they dive deeper into DeFi. We've already seen some of these products come out like Ave Arc, which is a permissioned lending pool with KYC AML built in. So who knows, with all these hacks and exploits going on, it could lead to a future called re-DeFi or regulated DeFi. Well, I'm wondering, were any of these lessons useful or helpful? Did they make you a savvier investor? If so, be sure to watch this video, which YouTube thinks you're gonna like. See ya.